I'm going to walk <laughs> because I'm not good at standing behind the podium. So welcome, everyone. The, the excerpt that I'm going to read is a first-hand account of 9-11 by Linda Holland Raithkoff. It's called Walk a Mile in Your Shoes. September 11th, 2001, was a glorious morning in New York City. I was working in my studio as a kaleidoscope of rays from the sun glimmered and reflected through the glass skylight over my head. When was a day so perfect? Boom, a blast, a roar suddenly froze me to the spot. I looked out the window, anticipating a sun shower. What else could explain such an unearthly sound? I thought of the childhood fairy tale with Chicken Little running around the town screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. A few minutes later, the phone rang. It was my husband. A plane just hit one of the towers at the World Trade Center. I heard it. I answered unruffled as though it was just another day in turbulent New York City. I live in Brooklyn Heights, just minutes away from downtown Manhattan across a bridge. It's no surprise that I would have heard the crash. I turned the television on to get the details. A second plane, an enormous aircraft, was crashing into the second tower. Oh my God, I shouted, recalling how years ago Orson Welles went on the radio with a fictional Martian invasion news story that listeners had believing it was true. But this wasn't that. I had heard the explosion, seen a plane go into the tower. Now the commentator was speaking of another plane that had hit the Pentagon. I stood paralyzed, not able to process what was happening. My husband's voice brought me back to that moment. They're closing all the offices in my building and apparently much of Manhattan, I'm coming home. Little did we know, that all means of commuter transportation in New York City were being shut down. Thousands of people were walking for hours over bridges, through tunnels, on highways to get to their homes. Those who lived too far away slept at friends' houses, in offices, and in the train stations. My home in Brooklyn is on Clinton Street, a direct path to and from the Brooklyn Bridge. My neighbors and I stood out the stood outside our houses watching the barrage of people coming our way. Can I help you? Can I help you? We repeated over and over again, offering bottles of water to everyone coming over the bridge. Since so much of the debris from the explosion sheathed city streets, many of the people were covered from head to toe with soot, like mummies in dreamlike states. They were exhausted and they were stunned. A young woman in a bright red dress <laughs> was painfully hobbling down the street in her high heels. I was wearing only a pair of yellow flip-flops and stepped out of them to give them to her. Please take these. You'll be so much more comfortable. She hesitated, but then gratefully accepted my meager offering. Thank you. Oh, thank you. She put her hand in mine. I don't think I could have made it all the way home in these, she said, pointing to the red and black high-heeled shoes that she must have carefully matched to her dress that morning. When what matched no longer wasn't of much importance at that time. She slid her feet into the yellow flip-flops with a big sigh of relief. Ah, uh, and I'll return them, I promise. There's no need. Keep them. I touched her arm as I answered, I have others. They're just cheap plastic flip-flops. <laughs> that night, the sandals were returned, and back on my doorstep the following day, the bell rang, and my new friend, Anna, stood at my doorstep. She had a bouquet of yellow roses. If you don't know, yellow roses are for friendship, she said as she offered them to me. I invited her in, and we spoke for quite a while about life and what mattered, and when, what went to the top of our life pyramids. My mother wants to meet you, she said with a smile. We laughed, and she took on a more serious tone. And I, I laughed and asked, why does your mother want to know where I bought, does she want to know where I bought the flip-flops for $1.99? <laughs> we laughed, and she took on a more serious note. My mother wants to meet the lady who stepped out of her shoes for me. 
Her gratitude felt disproportionate for what I considered the smallest gesture on my part. But I suppose on that day, no gesture or kindness seemed insignificant. A state of grace had come over New York City. Our city came to a complete halt for a few days and focusing on the essentials. It was a time for reflection, compassion, and ultimately gratitude that we could depend on one another. We could be kind. The unimaginable had happened and we were witness to it and pulled together in spite of it. A few months later, a letter came to me from Anna. Her appreciation was limitless. It was a gift certificate from a local restaurant that we both loved, and with it, a note. I will always remember you for your kindness on that terrible day, and it was an honor to walk a mile in your shoes. Now, the interesting thing about this gesture, as was mentioned in the, in the excerpt I just read, is to the person that gave the gesture, it was a small gesture, but to the person receiving, it was a big gesture. On this day, I think any one of us who had been there would have helped in any way that we could, giving the, our shoes or even the shirt off our back in that, in that situation. The harder thing about compassion is recognizing in your day-to-day -day life where you have an opportunity to do those things. So in other words, we get so uh, caught here in our own world, <laughs> in our own space, that we sometimes to remember to look up and look out. So in 2018, I encourage you to look up, look out, and see where you can make a small difference with compassion. Thank you.